Despite reams of data from experiments on the American public and a doubling of the research program at Camp Dietrich, the future of germ warfare did not look promising. Technological sophistication had been the driving principle behind aerosol delivery. That's pumping out these clouds of bacteria. The bacteriologist's dream was to isolate pathogens which could be cultured in staggering quantities and then directly infect the enemy. While insect-borne diseases were some of the best candidates for weaponization, the vectors were difficult to produce, handle, store, and disperse. However, the American scientists ran into the same problem that vexed the early work of Unit 731. Pathogens, in the end, are immobile wimps. So the microbiologists reluctantly but inevitably turned to the entomologists to provide the means for delivering the virulent but vulnerable pathogens. The researchers soon began to see the advantages of using insects as miniature missiles for delivering pathogenic warheads. While microbes are aerial plankton, biting insects are consummate hunters able to track their victims using an unparalleled sense of smell. As an added bonus, while gas masks exclude airborne germs, insects could circumvent this defense by squirming beneath clothing or finding patches of exposed skin. Moreover, the vectors would survive for days in the environment, their hunger mounting until an unwary enemy removed protective gear or moved into the area. The US military used a bit of discretion when it began field testing entomological weapons. Named with a touch of gallows humor, Operation Big Itch took place on the bleak landscape of Dugway Proving Grounds. The goal was to, de to determine if fleas could be reared, transported, loaded into munitions, and then delivered to a target in sufficient numbers to transmit disease to the enemy. The insects were not infected with plague, but the ultimate endpoint of this venture was clearly to improve upon the success of the Japanese. And so it was that in 1954, from the skies over the Utah desert, fleas rained down on cages of guinea pigs. The most uncertain aspect of the operation was whether the vectors would arrive, would survive and disperse after being launched from rather novel devices. The E-14 and E-23 munitions worked along similar lines. A cardboard cylinder about the size of a container of oatmeal was equipped with a mechanism to expel a burst of carbon dioxide from a pressurized cartridge. The force of the gas would rupture a bag of fleas within the cylinder, expelling them like shotgun pellets as the device tumbled earthward from a height of one to 2,000 feet. Except for a couple of glitches, Operation Big Itch was a success. Very few of the fleas died during transport. The munitions worked brilliantly. The insects descended without incidents, and the guinea pigs became infested. The only biological drawback was that the fleas gave up on finding hosts within about 24 hours, so it was evident that this entomological weapon would need to be used in close proximity to the enemy, well, at least if we were waging war with furry, furry rodents in a desert. The other operational drawback was fixable, but a bit more worrisome. In one of the trials, the E-23 components malfunctioned. A military euphemism for, might have, for what might have otherwise been called a disaster if the fleas had been carrying plague. The munition was supposed to become armed when a strip of sealing tape was removed, but one of the devices discharged while still in the plane. The hungry insects demonstrated their host-seeking capacities biting the pilot, bombardier, and military observer. But the Americans had an even bigger problem than insubordinate fleas. While the entomologists were planning a facility to produce 50 million fleas per week, the microbiologists were struggling to mass produce plague bacteria. During the Cold War, the Soviets managed to culture and weaponize Yersinia pestis, that is the bacteria, but US researchers never cracked the problem. So the military turned its attention to another insect-borne disease with perhaps even greater potential. The golden child of the American entomological warfare program was the yellow fever mosquito, Aedes aegypti. With the medical community per pursuing the eradication of the insect from the United States, the possibility of mass producing the vector put military interests squarely at odds with public health ideals. But this was a battle the generals were not going to lose. The real challenge would be finding a way to produce enormous quantities of infected mosquitoes. Feeding millions of adult insects on sick animals seemed to be impossibly complicated. Although this was the natural means of infection, the scientists at Camp Dietrich were not constrained by such limitations. The breakthrough came when researchers attempted a seemingly absurd experiment. 
adding the virus to the watery medium in which the mosquito larvae squirmed and fed. No such route of infection was possible in nature, so nobody held much hope that the wrigglers would uptake the pathogen from their aquatic surroundings. But when the adult mosquitoes emerged a few days later, they were fed on mice that, to the sheer delight of the scientists, contracted yellow fever, presumably not to the delight of the mice. With the newfound capacity to efficiently mass-produce infected mosquitoes, the next step was to determine if the insects could be weaponized. Now this meant testing vectors in the real world. Operation Big Buzz was a simulated mosquito-based attack. More than a million uninfected, Aedes mosquitoes were reared and stored for two weeks to simulate operational conditions. In May of 1955, about a third of the insects, the others being used for load loading and storage tests, were packed into E-14 munitions and dropped on rural Georgia because the southern United States was a hospitable environment for mosquitoes. Human volunteers and guinea pigs were placed at regular intervals from the target. Aedes aegypti spread, from, spread into the countryside and found hosts nearly a half mile downwind from the release site. The first test of vectors against human targets had been a rip-roaring success. Although fragments of declassified military records reveal the workings of Operation Big Buzz, only the general nature of the next two projects can be inferred. Both Operation Drop Kick and Operation Gridiron likely involve releases of mosquitoes, but the details of the experiments are not publicly available. The shift to a football theme in the naming of these operations is curious, but perhaps the military did not want to provide the enemy with clues as to the essence of the projects. Or perhaps cute names no longer had a place in what was becoming a deadly serious military program. For the United States had new reasons to worry about a biological Armageddon. In 1956, Soviet Defense Minister Georgi Zhukov announced that biological and chemical warfare would be used by their armed forces in future wars. In response, the United States frantically reassessed the nation's vulnerability to these weapons and the military's capacity to retaliate in kind. If the policy of mutually assured destruction was viable for nuclear arms, then extending the strategy to other weapons of mass destruction seemed logically consistent. Well, it's a bit difficult for any government to be rational when planning to kill the millions of people. The United States had long maintained strategic ambiguity regarding biological warfare, but the communist threat provided the perfect opportunity to make explicit the American policy. The National Security Council bluntly expressed the, willing, the country's willingness to retaliate in kind. To the extent the military effectiveness of the armed forces will be enhanced by the use, the United States will be prepared to use chemical and bacteriological weapons in general war. The decision as to the use will be made by the president. As for the matter of international law, the Army's position was that the United States is not party to any treaty now in force that prohibits or restricts the use and warfare of toxic or non-toxic gases, of smoke or incendiary materials, or of bacteriological warfare. We had not at that time signed the Geneva Convention, ratified the Geneva Convention. With the moral and political obstacles out of the way, the development of biological weapons was limited only by, the, only by science's capacity to conscript and, co conscript and coerce living organisms. By this time, the scientists at Camp Dietrich had a growing inventory of arthropod vectors available for further testing in terms of defense and continued development with respect to offense. There were colonies of mosquitoes infected with yellow fever, malaria, and dengue, flies harboring dysentery, cholera, and anthrax, fleas carrying plague, ticks loaded with tularemia, relapsing fever, and Colorado fever. The thriving entomological warfare division was attracting a cadre of outstanding researchers drawn by the military's advertisements that sidestepped the ultimate goal of the research while promising an unparalleled opportunity to carry out basic studies of effects of rearing procedures for various insects on longevity and fecundity and the effects of different environmental factors on infection of insects and the virulence of microorganisms. But with the heightened international tensions, the scientists were expected to focus on more pragmatic goals, like killing the enemy. 